people because there's no empire in history that has ever been able to squash a free people, ever. Maybe for a little duration or a short period of time, they may put the shackles on for a little while. But most of the shackles they have today are psychological shackles and they're shackles of information where they keep the information from the people. And once we release those shackles and those chains from ourselves and release ourselves from legal slavery, economic slavery, mental slavery, etc., and we liberate ourselves, then we are unstoppable. So that is my vision and my focus and ours as well for today. And that's where we're going to end up after about two hours tonight. And I hope that this will inspire all of us to take the next step to reclaim our sovereignty. So next, I'm going to talk about citizenship and the distinctions thereof, and we're going to review some points in history also, and I hope this will clarify it for people who maybe have uh, just been introduced to this and aren't really clear what a state citizen is versus what is an American national versus what is a sui juris free person. There are some fine line distinctions between these various classifications of free people, and I hope we'll make those clear tonight. Prior to 1868 in this country, there was no such thing as a United States citizen. They did not exist. It wasn't until the 14th Amendment that the U.S. citizen was created as a legal person born or naturalized in the United States. Prior to that and at the founding of this country were state citizens. If someone existed as a preamble citizen in the sovereign state of Virginia or New York or Pennsylvania, they considered themselves a Virginia citizen, a New York citizen, a Pennsylvania citizen, etc. They never thought of themselves as United States citizen. Prior to the Civil War and prior to 1868, no one ever referred to themselves as a U.S. citizen. Not even if they resided in the District of Columbia. They still considered themselves citizens of Virginia or New York, etc., etc. So it's a rather new concept, only about 130 so years old. But 220 years ago, firmly founded on those documents of American law that I already mentioned, the sovereignty was vested in the people. And the Treaty of Paris with Great Britain at the conclusion of the American Revolution said quite literally that the people shall have the same prerogative as the king. Now you don't have to be a genius to figure out what that means. If you're a king or a queen or a sovereign, it means there's no superior authority. There's no one you have to answer to except God and natural law and unalienable rights and all that. The natural law, that you do answer to. But there was no other human government or human being that you answered to as a sovereign or as a sovereign citizen. The American Revolution was fought on one of the issues was on the issue of land ownership and property ownership. And that at the conclusion of the American Revolution, the American people held the allodial titles to their property. An allodial title is another word for sovereign. If you were a king or a sovereign and you owned a piece of property, you didn't pay taxes to anyone. You didn't have anybody regulate you. There was no building codes. There was no zoning. There was no environmental laws. There was no other encumbrance that could attach to a sovereign property, to an allodial title. An allodial title is superior title. There is no superior title than a land patent. And so when the American Revolution was fought and the sovereign citizens, who were the white male property owners at the time, they then held their property in allodium. They owned it free and clear and outright, and the king, the prior king, could no longer tax them. But neither could the governments that they created, neither the state or the federal governments. So long as property is held in allodium, there is no superior authority. And that's the principle upon which America was founded. So that free people, sovereign people, could live on a sovereign piece of property. Remember the old saying, a king or a queen? You're like a king or a queen in your own home. You've heard the phrase. Well, that's what they meant. They really meant it quite literally. And being a sovereign meant that you had to act like one, a good one. Not a despot, but a good one. And a good sovereign is responsible for themselves and responsible for their family, responsible for their neighbors, and is respectful to their neighbors, and looks out after the greater community. That's what a good sovereign does. So the principle of sovereignty extends to our behaviors, to our values, to our virtues, to good Christian values as well. 
And so when the country was founded on those principles and then those principles were embraced by the system of law and the constitutions that were created, both on the state level and the federal level. So, prior to the Constitution, there were sovereign states that were free and independent states, quite literally. That's what it said in the Declaration of Independence and the Articles of Confederation. The states were free and independent, and the people were sovereign within those states. The Constitution was created out of the sovereignty of the people to create this 14th entity, originally, the United States Corporation, which served as both a corporate enterprise and a national government. It was carved out of a piece of Virginia and the Virginia Company, in fact. There were two corporations that came here when the country was settled, the New England Corporation in the north and the uh, Virginia Company in the south. And it was out of the Virginia Corporation that the United States Corporation was carved out of. Washington, D.C. was carved out of a prior corporation. It was deeded over and made into a separate jurisdiction and a separate country. So when the Constitution was created, there were then 14 countries here in the United States of America, the 13 colonies and the District of Columbia. 